Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. Today, we are handling a topic that is very interesting and sensitive in our series of occupational health, safety and well-being. If you recall, our course is the philosophy and leadership of occupational health and safety. Now, we have gone through a number of lectures, and uh, you'll agree with me that you have so far attended 14 lectures, and we've been doing this for the last uh, two months, right? And so, so we are now in the third month and uh, possibly will be completing uh, in this third month. So you can see uh, that uh, the lectures have taken long uh, and um, will be through probably after a period of four months uh, because as you can see, this is our 15th lecture and we have another 16th lecture before we conclude our course. And uh, given the way we are going and the way we cover uh, this course uh, weekly and the time that is available, the course takes us four months. And this is a four month course uh, to deliver. And then thereafter we have discussions uh, and so forth. So I want to thank you for being patient because we have already uh, covered uh, the three months and we're in the fourth month and uh, I think we've done a good job and good justice uh, to the subject uh, and the course which is the philosophy and uh, leadership of occupational health and safety. Now if you recall uh, in our last lecture uh, 14 we covered uh, the concept of leadership. We actually introduced the concept of leadership. We compared leadership uh, with other forms of leadership. And here I'm talking about safety leadership being pitted against the other types of leadership. So we're able to examine what is so unique about safety leadership that you can't find in other forms of leadership transactional leadership, authentic leadership, and plus many other forms of leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we are able to uh, uh, demonstrate to you those particular aspects that constitute uh, safety leadership. Today, allow me to take you to the 15th lecture. And in our lecture here, we shall be handling the uh, top, uh, a topic that deals with safety leadership behaviors, uh, transforming the intangible to the intangible. After understanding what safety leadership is all about, I want to demonstrate to you the safety leadership behaviors and move into another dimension of transforming the intangible to the tangible in as far as occupational health, safety, and well-being of employees is concerned. Now, in this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, I intend to uh, go through a number of things. And um, these things are based on the premise that the ability to transfer theory into practice is where a lot of leadership efforts fail. Because I know the theory exists, but we must be able to transfer theory into practice. After all, a good theory is that theory that is able to explain reality out there, explain practice. And in fact, in simple forms, when you are trying to uh, define the, the concept of a theory, we refer to a theory uh, simply as what we consider to be nets or a net that is thrown out there in a certain setting to try and capture reality. 
So a good theory is a theory that is able to explain reality, and therefore the ability to transfer theory into practice is where a lot of leadership efforts fail. Now, in this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, the lecture has been broken into various uh, aspects that are aimed at answering a number of questions. So one of the questions that we intend to answer in this lecture is, uh, what are the psychological and the cognitive influences on behavior? But from a safety leadership perspective, therefore, I'll take you through those theories, right? And of course, the other question we shall attempt to answer is how does behavior-based safety link up with safety leadership? So remember, we have behavior-based safety linking up with safety leadership. And the third question is for us to explore some of the examples of tangible safety leadership behaviors. What are they? Because we must draw lessons uh, from these uh, s uh, tangible safety leadership behaviors. And then, of course, uh, lastly, we shall try to examine ways of adapting their style of leadership to develop a specific set of safety leadership behaviors, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to welcome you to this lecture. But before that, I should give you the key objectives of this lecture. Uh, so after attending this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that at the end of the day, you'll gain some kind of understanding uh, on what influences safety behavior, as well as having enhanced ability to contextualize safety leadership. Now with the specific objectives of this lecture, they deal with a holistic understanding of variables that can influence safety leadership, uh, which are rooted in the empirical foundations of psychology, neuropsychology, cognitive and behavioral safety as disciplines. And then we shall be able to guide you on how you can develop your suit of safety leadership behaviors through the exploration of what we call transactional and transformational safety leadership behaviors. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our 15th lecture. And those are the things that we are going to discuss in this lecture. Now, let me just remind you a few things. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders are measured by their actions. Leaders are measured by actions as opposed to their intentions. And those are the aspects I discussed in our lecture 14. Do not forget at the end of the day, you will be measured by the reality, what they see. So when people discuss leading with safety, the common transactional behaviors must be mentioned or are mentioned. And again, that provides evidence to prove the point that I'm trying to drive home. And of course, uh, they will include things like uh, a safety walkthrough or talking about safety with the workers. So they want that blueprint where you are going to discuss those aspects. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me at this material time to uh, bring up these two concepts and discuss them so that you understand what we are talking about. I want to talk about behavior-based safety and safety leadership behaviors. And if we want to understand safety leadership, we must come from there. So can we then start with the role of behavior-based safety? Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to note the behavior of safety and the origins and roots of this concept of behavioral safety. We have to understand it, but we need to know where it is rooted. Behavior safety, ladies and gentlemen, has its roots within behavioral psychology. 
And it is based upon the fundamentals of such psychologists as Thondick, psychologists as Ivan Pavlov, psychologists like Gary Skinner, uh, and um, the works of Bandura, uh, notwithstanding a number of other psychologists who have uh, come up with a number of theories that do provide the conceptualization and the development of behavioral best safety at the workplace. And if you recall, I did tell you in our lecture one and in subsequent lectures that for us to be able to understand the concept of occupational health, safety, and well being, then we need to pursue an interdisciplinary approach. Therefore, we pick knowledge from economics, from psychology, uh, from uh, environmental sciences, natural sciences, uh, psychology, uh, to mention a few. So there are a number of disciplines that help us understand these concepts. So when we begin talking about behavioral-based safety, then we go into psychology. Now let me begin with one of the scholars, celebrated scholars in this area, and that is uh, Thondek. Uh, uh, Thondek in 1898 came up with what you call the law of effect. And this is a psychologist, a behavioral uh, best psychologist uh, who came up with the law of effect. Now according to Thondek's principle of the law of effect, Behavior that is followed by pleasant consequences is likely to be repeated. So if you display certain actions, and those actions are followed by pleasant consequences, then for you as an individual, you will repeat that behavior. Do not forget to relate this concept to occupational health and safety, but more specifically, safety leadership. Now again, Thondek did say that behavior that is followed by unpleasant consequences is likely not to be repeated. So the moment you receive unlikely consequences, unpleasant, unpleasant consequences, then you will not repeat those behaviors. So that is Thondek. Now the ideas of Thondek are certainly similar to the ideas of scholars who came after him, and that was uh, really around 1898, and there are so many scholars who came, like Bandura, who came in 1960, and uh, uh, came up with the social learning theory in 1961. But prior to that, the idea of Thondek, there were basically rooted in the works of Ivan Pavlov, who carried out experiments in the 1890s. I'm sure you are very familiar with the Pavlovian conditioning, right? And of course, also known as the classical conditioning theory. Now, according to Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov, uh, Pavlov puts forth an argument, and he says that, uh, uh, learning, learning involves pairing a stimulus with a conditioned response. And of course, in the famous experiments that Ivan Pavlov conducted with his dogs, Pavlov found that objects or events could trigger a conditioned response. And therefore, when we are talking about employees at the workplace and dealing with issues of safety at the workplace, these aspects do come up. And therefore, that is what Pavlov came up with. So objects or events could trigger a conditioned response. Therefore, uh, Ivan Pavlov designed an experiment using a bell as a neutral stimulus. Now, we also know that Gary Skinner in 1938 came up with a, a concept of operant uh, conditioning. And according to Gary Skinner, operant conditioning is a method of learning that occurs through rewards and punishments for behavior. So if you reward right behavior, then uh, learning takes place. And that is referred to as operant conditioning. If you punish for certain behavior, then again, 
operant conditioning is taking place and that behavior is not likely to be repeated. So therefore Skinner identified three types of, of responses uh, or operants that could follow behavior. And therefore the first operant uh, or what we call uh, conditioning or response is what he called neutral operants. And according to Skinner, uh, Gareth Skinner, the under operant conditioning, right, uh, or what we call uh, neutral operants, responses from the environment that neither increase nor decrease the probability of a behavior being repeated. Now, for him, he's looking at that element of neutral, right? So neutrality occurs at the point, all right, where responses from the environment will neither increase nor decrease the probability of a behavior being repeated. Now the second uh, uh, operant is what he referred to as reinforcers. And therefore, here he articulates that responses from the environment that increase the probability of a behavior being repeated, right, are called reinforcers, right? And therefore, if you reward for certain behavior, that's, an, that's a reinforcement. And that's why you have positive reinforcement. And of course, the other one are the negative, negative reinforcement, and that comes under punishers. Responses from the environment that decrease the likelihood of a behavior being repeated. So in this case, punishment weakens behavior. Now, another psychologist called Bandura, 1961, who came up with a number of experiments, but more so the Bobo doll experiment. We see that when this doll was placed in front of the preschool children and it was attacked by the adults, then the children developed mimicking behaviors. We see that children mimicked the behavior of the adults by attacking the doll in the same fashion. Now, according to Bandura's social learning theory, learning occurs through observation and interactions with other people. Essentially, people learn by watching others and then imitating these actions. And that's the element of mimicking. And uh, even then, when you look at his um, uh, later works, when he talks about uh, self-efficacy theory, the social learning theory, 1970 and so forth, you discover that he's talking about issues that relate to behaviors of individuals and those aspects that I've mentioned coming up. For instance, under uh, vicarious, uh, well, under the self-efficacy theory, you have an active mastery. You have vicarious learning, for instance. So you, 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 you learn from the people that you interact with quite often, and you model your behavior uh, towards that. And exactly that's what happened with the Bobo doll uh, experiment. I will not really go into details uh, with that experiment, but I just wanted to show you uh, what happens with the behavior-based safety paradigm. So we see that here all behaviors are influenced by triggers, uh, otherwise known as activators or antecedents. And uh, by how the consequences of such behavior uh, are seen by the individuals who are mimicking these behaviors, then the uh, uh, forthcoming uh, behaviors will be displayed. So certain behaviors will be modeled along this direction. Therefore, behavior in this sense is defined as an observable act, ladies and gentlemen. So therefore, by exploring safety leadership behaviors, a focus will be on the observable, what the employees are able to see, what other people see, and therefore organizations need to develop and implement behavior-based 
safety uh, program at the workplace. So that's why I told you at the beginning of this lecture that, you know, it is not the intent that people will see, but the actions or the reality at the workplace, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, the purpose of behavior-based safety program is to identify any at-risk behaviors and to reinforce any observable safe behaviors at the workplace. And the benefits of such a program can be tremendous. The benefits can be based upon increased safety interactions, uh, the uh, rectifying of any risk, what you call any at-risk behaviors uh, prior to those behaviors resulting in an injury. Uh, therefore, behavioral-based safety program is an important aspect that needs to be taken up. And that's why you need to do some bit of coaching at the workplace, provide accurate information, and of course your actions also will mean a lot. And ideally, a culture of trust and openness will develop at the workplace. So that is what we call the behavior-based uh, strategies so, or, or actions or program. Let me now take you to the second program that we call specific safety leadership behaviors. Now for us to address the vagueness of leaders defining their own safety leadership behavior as walking the walk, you know there are such words, walk the walk, I'm not talking about walking the talk, no, walking the walk, right. But you can also talk about walking the talk. So other than talking about walking the walk, some extensive research has been undertaken with general managers, uh, project managers, health and safety uh, and environmental specialists, and then um, uh, health and safety officers in various organizations, and construction managers, and factory managers, and so forth. And of course, from research, ladies and gentlemen, a number of safety leadership behaviors we are noted which can be grouped into three categories. So ladies and gentlemen, at this moment, allow me to take you to the screen here so that you are able to see those three uh, basic uh, behaviors that fall under uh, vision, safety, and engagement. So you can see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can see from uh, this screen here Right, and there is a table that is displayed there, right. In this table, we have what we call contextualized safety leadership behavior. They are contextualized. So they fall under three categories, as you can see. We begin with, for instance, uh, safety behaviors. And these are the ones that are the defining features uh, of safety leaders. Then from there we go to the middle where we have engaged, or what we call engagement behaviors. Right, and remember engagement is one of the attributes of safety leaders that we covered in the previous lectures. And of course, uh, we also have vision setting behaviors. And these are aspects that uh, we discuss. Now you can see the details uh, that underlie uh, these behaviors here as you can see. And these are very, 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 very important. All right. And if you must really uh, develop uh, those traits of leadership that will help every employee at the workplace to function maximally while at the same time uh, avoiding health-related issues or ailments and uh, being safe and promoting well-being these are the three things that we are supposed to do at the workplace. And uh, therefore, you need to hold the team meetings, for instance, from time to time, because if you are talking about engaging behaviors, then team meetings are very important, right? Uh, you create a leadership presence at employee inductions to introduce yourself and share some personal information. Uh, here, uh, you must have uh, conversations with employees about non-work related issues and inquiring about work issues. Uh, you share personal safety stories, uh, experiences, 
Uh, you also facilitate non-work related events, etc. You talk with people and all those are engaging behaviors. Under safety behaviors, then you must provide uh, feedback and then you uh, must bring up those issues uh, that lead to personal protect, uh, uh, protections or protectives. Uh, you must wear the personal protective equipment uh, which are provided at the workplace. You must display uh, safe behaviors here uh, under safety behaviors as you can see and the participating and rotating uh, uh, chairing safety forums and uh, realigning safety meetings uh, on the project. So those things are very important. Now for vision setting as you can see you create uh, a safety charter or safety vision for the project, uh, for the organization with a core leadership team. You talk about safety vision or character uh, or charter with all employees and key stakeholders. You reward employees based upon the behaviors uh, and then of course there's also detailing leadership expectations. Uh, you use expressive language uh, in doing all those things, ladies and gentlemen. So those things are very important uh, because we need to understand uh, the issue of safety and avoid uh, psychological safety via stress. We avoid depression, we avoid fatigue, we avoid um, uh, anxiety, and that's why we have all those three aspects, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, it means that at the end of the day, as leaders, we must uh, uh, come up with adaptive uh, safety leadership behaviors uh, because of the differences in the industry, although knowledge has been created, uh, our conceptualization and our understanding uh, uh, of these things will vary from sector to sector, industry to industry. So adaptive safety leadership behaviors are very important. Uh, you need also to come up with the personal variables and influences on behavior, and then uh, try to understand the cognitive aspects. The mind uh, means a lot, because most of the things are really done uh, in the mind, ladies and gentlemen. So those are things which are very critical and uh, they are very important and we just have to understand those things very well. So I will invite you during your free time, ladies and gentlemen, for us to, in order to understand these things very well, we need to understand adaptive safety leadership behavior, so go and read about them. You have to read about personal variables and influences on behavior, so issues of cognition will come in here. Then we have to look at integrated biopsychosocial models uh, where we are uh, taken up into the issue of biomechanics and genetics which can have um, uh, their foundations uh, placed within biological psychology and how these will actually influence leadership behavior. Uh, you have to study also cognitive safety uh, so that we understand that concept very well. How uh, the brain works is also very important and that takes us into neuroplasticity uh, so that we understand why people do uh, the kind of things that they do and the implications of these things at the workplace, ladies and gentlemen. So we need to understand them because they are very, very, very important. And uh, in so doing, we shall be able to dismiss uh, the concepts that you are used to and the things and the statements you've been hearing uh, where people say that leaders are born not made. If you understand the concept of neuroplasticity, you will dismiss that concept very well, right? Because you know what comes up in neuroplasticity. In neuroplasticity, we are told that our brain is made up of billions of brain cells called neurons which are connected to each other through what we call the synapses. And the more connected you are in terms of these elements here, the more frequent or competent you are, and you would be uh, able to perform certain tasks with ease, right, because of these neural uh, connections. And uh, if an individual, for instance, has a history of leading in a manipulative manner, then what they have are a series of synapses uh, connected in a certain way, which allows them to lead in such ways. And therefore, uh, changing their behavior is not impossible. You can, especially when you work on these things, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, uh, when we get exposed to that knowledge, then you'll be able to dismiss those things that I've just told you. 
that leaders are born, not made. But how about these ones, the neurons, the synapses, and the rest of them, the neurotransmitters, the dopamine neurons, right, which help us to think uh, 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 and stimulate uh, our, our behaviors uh, towards social interactions, ladies and gentlemen. So therefore, we need to think about these things very, very well. And that's why I'm inviting you to go and read that discipline called neuroplasticity and relating it to leadership so that we understand leadership concepts and behaviors. So I'll not really now go into the psychological aspects, but um, uh, let me uh, call your attention back uh, from uh, this table so that I briefly go through uh, psychological considerations and uh, probably also wind up uh, so that uh, we plan uh, for our next lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to talk about now psychological considerations. I know I've talked about them, but uh, as I told you earlier on, there is no way we can dismiss psychology uh, in this area and uh, in this uh, body of knowledge that we are trying to discuss. So there are psychological considerations. Now, of course, uh, each individual, that is me, you, and others, process information from both the internal and external stimuli. And of course, how each person makes sense of this information can help influence current behaviors. So information here becomes a key element. And therefore, with a broad understanding which we have reached now on how the neurons are connected, I ask you to go and read that area. We can start linking now that subject to what we call psychology. And of course, uh, in uh, the area of psychology, you can talk about the conscious and the subconscious, right? And of course, the, the information we pick right, is uh, probably consciously uh, or subconsciously uh, digested by an individual. And therefore, there's a constant stimuli that enters the human brain, and such information may be based upon what we call environmental cues, uh, such as people speaking around you, uh, weather temperatures and background noise, Alternatively, you will have self-dialogue, right? Uh, I know these days when you find somebody uh, talking to himself, uh, you will start saying, well, that man is mad. And that is not necessarily correct. People reflect on certain things. You may have self-dialogue uh, uh, within you, and you do not produce any noise, right? But you can also... Uh, produce noise and people will hear you talking, right? Not, it's not necessarily correct uh, to say that everybody that you find talking to himself is actually a mad person. So we say here that as human beings, ladies and gentlemen, we do not process every bit of stimuli, right? As human being, this information is processed by the reticular activating system of the brain, where relevant information is sent to the conscious brain and the other superfluous information is sent to the subconscious. So you do not digest everything and you don't process everything. So some information goes to the conscious while the other part of it goes to the subconscious brain. Now, what one pays attention to in this case could be a product of previous activities or information that is deemed important. And of course, a practical example is illustrated in the research that uh, we have done, research that I've done with my colleagues. And uh, if you go to the internet, I've published a paper and this paper was published in 2013, and his leadership styles, workplace politics, and moral identity of Ugandan public procurement staff. And this was published in the International Journal of Public Administration uh, in volume 36. 
Uh, and you see that from page 35 to page 44. Now, the other paper that we have published uh, with my colleagues, again in 2013, it also brings out leadership issues. And that paper is on leadership ethical orientations, uh, mindfulness, task autonomy, and procurement contract performance among the PDEs in the COMESA member states. Right, and of course it is published in the World Journal of Management Sustainable Development. So you can actually pick that information from there. And I want also to invite you to do some research and publish in the Journal of Sustainable Development. Right. Now, from my work that I have been doing over time, there are certain things that I have learned. Right. And these things are quite important and related to the things that I've just really talked about. Right. Uh, let me just um, give you an example. Right. Uh, of course, taken from my works and uh, the experience, right? So let's imagine that you have a leader who does not value the development of team leaders, or team members, not leaders. So a leader, right, leading a team, but does not value the development of team leaders, right? And by the way, this is one of the things that we have discovered in our work. Therefore, in this case, the mantra that the, uh, these fellows were running uh, in this study uh, was based around the notion that if they were in his team, right, uh, and that is the team leader's uh, team that has been crafted, developed over time, and implemented over time, if I'm a member of the team, then I'm very important, and everything that is said in that team is true, correct, and very useful. So uh, that leader never valued the team leaders, uh, team members, right? And he had that thinking that um, uh, if somebody joins the team, all will be all right because uh, they have gone through the dynamics of uh, team building and that uh, they have also gained knowledge, and even during the time of the meetings, they share that information, and therefore everybody is educated. So that, is the, that was the thinking. Now, they also thought that if these members join the team, they will automatically become top, top performers. Right? That was the thinking. And uh, they also, he also thought that, uh, well, these individuals who have joined the meeting, right, uh, 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 because uh, they, uh, they are part of the team, then they have gained knowledge, right? And therefore, it's more or less like participating in leadership trainings. And uh, therefore, these people do not need any further training. Now, as a result, uh, the development of the staff in this team uh, became a little bit routine in nature, right? And uh, members discovered at the end of the day that this team actually was a core. The team, most of the things that were there were routine. Most of the things were boring. Most of the things were, there was an element of imposition in the teams. And they also thought that uh, uh, this team was not actually enriching. So over time, uh, the scope and the quality of the members of workers in this team started to uh, certainly uh, suffer. So uh, the team members uh, started, uh, of course, uh, fighting each other. There was uh, infighting. There was backbiting. There was bickering in the team. And uh, uh, all these things uh, taken up. So from our data, we have discovered that in this team that I'm specifically talking about, there was an overconfidence bias, which is governed by the leader's belief that no further development is needed. Uh, from the same data set, we also discover that any learning or development opportunities were not in the conscious mind, conscious mind of the leader. And also discover that the opportunities were not passed on to the team members to develop. And that opportunities for growth, innovation, and personal development 
became uh, four seconds. Uh, and that's what really happened. And that's why we've just gone through these issues uh, of uh, psychology and, uh, of course, uh, the other aspect that I presented uh, slightly before psychology that I did uh, call neuroplasticity. And I want you to go and read neuroplasticity because when you combine neuroplasticity and psychology, we understand the behavior of individuals and employees at the workplace, ladies and gentlemen. So those are important aspects that we get from our research work that is based uh, on research. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had and we have been exposed to those disciplines and how uh, what we call safety and how safety leadership can evolve uh, by picking knowledge from those disciplines. And of course, at the end of the day, since we have an area of psychology, we need to uh, be mindful about cognitive distortions, right? And uh, avoid those negative self-commentary, right? Uh, or negative self-commentaries, right? And uh, of course, uh, they result into what we, an acronym that we can call ANTS in this case, right? And of course, uh, those aspects are going to be discussed uh, in detail here because they are very, very important. And possibly uh, at that point, that's where I'll end. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a plethora of distortions uh, which are well documented by back 1995 and examples of such distortions include, for instance, filtering. Filtering is a distortion because in this case, right, uh, filtering, right, that we think is very critical at this moment is categorized by an individual paying undue attention to one negative detail without seeing the big picture or bigger picture of the second one. Now, the other one is overgeneralization, right? And the overgeneralization, you are talking about sweeping negative conclusions that go beyond the current situation. And of course, we have got catastrophizing, uh, of course, predicting the future negatively without considering more plausible outcomes and emotional reasoning that comes in there. And of course, personalization as the last uh, component uh, of this. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take this opportunity at this material time to uh, close our lecture. And uh, in our next lecture, we shall actually start with cognitive distortions and conclude our lecture. Now, just to remind you, um, about the things that we have covered, because it is very important uh, for us to know where we are coming from. This was lecture five on safety leadership behaviors, transforming the intangible to the tangible. Right, one of the things that we have achieved so far is for us to know the psychological and cognitive influences on behavior. We have also looked at behavior-based safety link uh, with safety leadership and ladies and gentlemen in our next lecture we shall continue and discuss uh, the examples of tangible safety leadership behaviors and also conclude by examining uh, the type of behaviors or styles of leadership that can be adopted at the workplace to achieve what we call safety leadership behaviors. Thank you very much for attending this lecture. Thank you very much for coming. I can only say stay home and stay safe until uh, next time when we meet, uh, which is next week, to try and uh, discuss uh, uh, our lecture, uh, the, the, the aspects uh, uh, lecture 16. Thank you very much. I wish you a nice day. Bye.